Hey, this is Ken Finnan at Capital Advantage Tutoring, and it's my job to get you past the Series 7 exam. The big kahuna, the big Series 7, the Series 7 top-off, just called the Series 7, not the SIE exam, the Series 7 exam. Now, I can't believe I jumped past this. I went. I was so excited, I guess, to do the bonds and the options. Totally missed equities. Can't believe it. I'm sorry. Trying to make up for it now. Hopefully, we get it out there. So equities, we're talking about common stock, preferred, stuff like that. If you want a little primer, go check out my SIE video where I talk about it, and we'll go from there. When corporations want to raise money, they have different ways of doing it. They can do bonds, they can do preferreds, they can do common stock, they can borrow the money, whatever it is. So what they, uh, the most conservative way they can do it is through common stock, because they don't actually owe anything other than to, to do the right thing for you. Like with bonds, they have to pay a coupon every six months. With preferred, they have to pay a, a dividend. They're supposed to pay a dividend every quarter or semi-annual or even monthly. But common stock, they just got to do the right thing. They don't have to pay a dividend. They're not pressured to do it. It all depends. So when a corporation is going to give up, raise money, they're going to give up some of their equity. This is what common stock is. They're giving up ownership in the company. Okay, So that's what they're doing. They're selling part of their company in the share in the form of common stock, which is shares ownership, okay? The more shares you own, the more of the company you own. If you buy all the shares, you now own the company. Almost like if you can buy 50.1% of the company, you now own it. You don't really need to own, own that much. If you own even 10%, you have definite, you're a control person, which means you have definite influence on the company. So when, when a company decides to issue for the first time, they're going to first they're going to do it in the corporate charter and all that the articles of are the articles wow the articles of incorporation i can't say anything are going to list a lot of things and one of the things they're going to list is how many shares were authorized to issue so it's not how many we're going to issue it's just how many were allowed to issue some crazy number say it's 400 million whatever it is but that's not what we're issuing to raise the money we're issuing a set number so the next one is how many we actually issue. So let's get into it. So let's say I authorize, ooh, pink, cute. They us authorize 10 million shares. I'm not gonna issue them, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna issue like 1 million, right? I'm gonna issue a million shares. I don't need a lot. And maybe, well, that's, that's like a weird million, right? There we go, a million shares. Maybe I talk to my underwriter and they tell me, look, Ken, great company, the tutoring, it's awesome. You're good. You're the goat. You're best. I'm kidding. Um, we think we could sell it for $20 a share. So that would give us, we issue a million shares to the public at 20 a share. That's going to give us a whopping $20 million to play with. Boom, that's issued. Now, what if I, after a while, I go, you know what? The stock's trading at 20 or say it's trading at 18. I want to buy some of it back. So I'm going to buy back. I'll buy back 100,000 shares. Buy back 100,000 shares. You know, at, you know, at, you say it's, say it's training at, sadly it went down at 15. I'm going to buy that back, whatever that costs. Now, the thing is I had a million shares and now I bought them back. These are called treasury, okay? Treasury stock or treasury shares. Remember, they're not by the government. They're just called treasury because you're using the corporate treasury to buy them back. Treasury stock, okay? You can't trade them. It's not like you can go to the company and say, I want some of your treasury stock. It's kind of like retired money. And there's a bunch of reasons I would do this. One, kind of to hold the stock from dropping too much, or I think it's too cheap, or maybe I want to get some back some of my ownership, or even Maybe I'll, if I'm paying dividends, I'm going to lower what I have to pay in dividends. A million reasons to buy it back. There are rules on that. I don't think they do on the test, but let's talk about it. If I'm going to buy back my stock, that's called the company buyback. 10B18 is a rule number. There are rules on this. So if you're going to buy your own company stock back, they want to make sure that you're not manipulating the price, right? I mean, that's fair. They want to make sure that you're not manipulating and forcing the price up. So they have rules called safe harbor rules. And again, I should say they're rules, but they're guidelines. You don't have to follow them, but if you do, you won't be you won't be accused of manipula manipulating the price. I'm gonna... One of them is you can't buy in the opening. The opening price, that's the most volatile time. You can't buy in the opening. A second one is you can't buy within the last 10 minutes. 
if it's on an exchange or the last 30 minutes if it's not on the exchange, 30 minutes of the day, right? So if it's over the counter, you can't buy after 3.30. If it's on an exchange, you're active, what they call it, you, can, you can't buy after 3.50. Also, you're not supposed to do more than 25% of the average daily trading volume. And you can't, but you can only buy in a zero plus stick, which just means you can't create a new high. Stocks trading at 42, you can buy it at 42 all you want. You cannot buy it at 42 or one until somebody else either bids that or pays that price. So if you're going to buy it back, you follow those guidelines and you won't be in trouble for manipulating the price. That's called the corporate buyback. 10B18 in case you like numbers. Now, this million shares we issued, we bought back 100 in treasury. That leaves us 900,000 in outstanding shares. So just outstanding. No, outstanding means out there in trading, okay? That's what's out there in trading, the 900,000. Boom. Always remember, to get outstanding, it's always issued. Oh, I can't hit the button. Issued minus treasury equals outstanding. Now, remember, even this treasury stock, and I got a question like this at something, maybe not the actual test, but maybe so. Who knows? Um, I'm not saying either way. Um, they say, what is treasury stock called? And it's issued. Remember, once it's issued, it's always issued. Even when it's bought back, it's still been issued. It's just not outstanding anymore. And remember, issued minus treasury equals outstanding. Super easy. Okay. Now, let's talk about what rights you have as a common shareholder. So before I get into that, understand you're an owner. You get to do things. And as the company does better, you the stock should go up based on supply and demand. And one of the reasons, uh, we'll do that later. So now we'll come back to it. Stay tuned. Okay. Now, what rights do we have? We have the right to evidence of ownership. Basically, you're going to get a piece of paper if you really want it. It says you own Ken Finnan, you own a share of IBM or GE or Tesla, whatever it is. Okay, second, you have the right to transfer, which seems like not a big deal, but it's massive. Because if you would invest in my LLC, it would take you weeks and lawyers to get in and then you go, wow, I hate that guy. Weeks and lawyers to get out. Here, right to transfer, ease of transfer, boom, you wanna buy shares of my company if it's trading on the stock exchange at 10 a.m. and then at 11.30, you go, forget it, I'm out. Just buy in and then you sell out. That's ease. That's pretty good, okay? That's what right of, tra right of transfer is, and that actually is important. You also have the right to inspect the books and records. That does not mean you can go sit there and tell Elon Musk to move out of his desk while you check through his paperwork. No, it's like getting 10 Qs and 10 Ks and 8 Ks and other things that they'll send you that any shareholder would get, okay? They usually mail it to you. There you go, Yeah. You have the right to vote. Now, hopefully you know this from the SIE, but we're going to go deeper. You have the right to vote on certain matters like mergers and takeovers and board of directors, okay? You have the right to vote on the board of directors. You can either vote in poison, you can either vote in poison, or you can vote by proxy, okay? So let's talk proxies by mail, and there's some rules with that, like the proxy materials to vote get sent from the issuer to the broker-dealer, and then the broker dealer sends them to you. The broker dealer cannot charge you for that mail. Okay. And if you don't make a choice, if it's not an important issue, if you don't choose or return it, then the broker dealer can um, make the vote for you. But let's talk about there's two types of voting that we want to talk about statutory accumulative. Okay. So here we are. So we have three board seats open. You get to vote on this, and you have 100 shares. Now, under statutory, okay, under statutory, you get 100 votes per seat, okay? And you have to use them per seat. So what's going to happen is, you know, 100 shares, you get to vote 100 shares for Mary. So you put, you know, put your 100 votes in here for Mary, for A. And then over here for Groucho, maybe, maybe you don't like Groucho, you like Zeppos or Zeppos, so you're going to do 100 shares for Zeppo. We got Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe running here, and then you can put 100 shares for B, Cheatham, okay? And that's it. You're done, okay? If you decide not to vote for them, you kind of lose the votes. That's statutory. Now, cumulative, a little different. Let's say you really, really like Groucho. So here's what happens. You get 100 shares 
three board seats, that means you're going to get 300 votes, just like the other one. We have to use them your way. So 300 votes. So you notice you don't get more votes. You just get, you'll see that you get more voting power. So you can use, say, you can use these votes any way you want. So let's say I want my 300 votes. I really like Groucho. So I put all 300 votes on A in here. Now, but now the problem is that means I've used all my votes. I don't get to vote for the other ones. That's the way it works. So statutory, I'll do 100, 100, 100, because I had 100 chairs per board seat. And if it's cumulative, I still get 100 chairs per board seat, but I can load them all up onto one single person. So, I, so it, it gives a minority shareholder more voting power. It doesn't give them more shares or more votes. It just gives them more voting power because they can lump all on one. And maybe they get a block of other people to sit there and vote and they can kind of get someone in there they want. Perfect. Okay, so let's talk about different things. So one thing that can happen is a spinoff. So a spinoff is like when I was younger, um, I did when I was delivering pizza for Pizza Hut and all that, I was sitting there at one time and the Pepsi truck showed up and I'm like, oh, interesting. And the Pepsi unloaded the food here. And then they went around to the other side of the parking lot, unloaded a Taco Bell and boom, went around and unloaded a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Oh, I didn't know that at the time. I was 18 years old that Pepsi owned all those things. Now, fast forward to me working on the stock exchange. And Pepsi decided to spin off their delivery food services where they're delivering to the Pizza Hut and all that. And they called it Yum Brands. I think they actually put all their Frito-Lays, Pepsi, um, Frito-Lays, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Pizza Hut, all them under this Yum Brand. So what happened was, if say there was one share of Pepsi that you own at $40, and then they spun off the Yum Brands, after they spun it off, it basically just kick it out and now shareholders... Instead of owning one share of Pepsi at 40, they now own one share of Pepsi at 20 and another share of Yum at 20. Still the same $40, but they spun it off into a different kind of company. Then we have like mergers and takeovers and stuff like that. Like you can have a company take over another one. You can actually have or a merger or they consolidate all this stuff. Another thing that can happen is a tender offer. So let's say your stock's trading at 50 bucks a share. And Carl Icahn walks in and goes, wait, I've done the math. This thing's worth 60. So he will make an offer, a tender offer to you to say, I want to buy those shares. Okay. Well, not the dog stuff. My golden is, I love her, but okay. Now stocks trading at 50. They're going to make an offer to buy your shares at 60 bucks for like at least 20 days, maybe a little longer. And they'll say, we'll buy up to 10 million shares. Now you can tender your shares and say, listen, that's great. I'm just going to sell my shares to Carl Icahn and he'll pay me $60 a share. The thing is the stock will rise right to the price. So it doesn't really matter because look, if, if I'm going to offer to buy, you know, 10 million shares at 60, the price of the stock will rise to almost 60. Um, so you can tender your shares, which means give into it, but there's a couple of rules. One is, you have to be actually long the shares, which sounds stupid, right? You have to actually own them. But if you own a thousand shares and you're short 10 calls, you don't own shit. Those are covered, okay? Covered calls. You have to get rid of the calls and then you can tender. If you own convertible bonds or convertible verge or own calls, you don't own shit until you convert them or give exercise instructions or conversion instructions. Then you own them. Then you can tender your shares. There's also, there's a thing that you can be short against the box where you're long the stock and short it at the same time. You can only tender what you are actually long. So if you're long a thousand and short 800, you can only tender 200 shares. You can just buy the shares back and then you can, but that's what that is. So that's called the short tender rule. You can only tender what you're actually long. I hope that helps. We also have a thing called the leverage buyout. It's basically a company taking over another one, but they're either going to borrow by issuing debt or borrow from a bank, or they're going to use some sort of debt to finance the purchase. That happened in the 80s and 90s with Mike Milken. He was basically, he would look at a company and say, oh, I want to buy it. He would use the assets of the company he wants to buy to get issue bonds to take over the company. It was crazy. I mean, he was a genius, but whatever. So another right you have is a right to maintain your percentage ownership. So those are called preemptive rights, okay? 
So preemptive rights are the right to maintain your percentage ownership. Okay, so let's say you own a million, there's a million shares outstanding. We've already done how they get that. And you own 100,000 shares. So you are a 10% owner. Good, okay, so now, since you're a 10% owner, that's great. But what if the company issues another? What if they do an additional offering, an APO or a follow-on, okay, or a follow-on of another 200 shares? Well, what's going to happen is there's now more shares on standing. You're getting diluted a little bit, not a ton, but you're getting diluted and that's not okay. So what they're going to do is they're going to give you a preemptive right, the right to maintain your percentage ownership. If you beat the SIE, you should know this, okay? So now you're going to get a right there short term. You get one right for every share you own, right? So in this case, you're going to get 100,000 rights. Now, the thing is, you, you'll you not be able to hand in, unless they do an exact doubling of their shares, you will not get to hand in one right and get one new share. You may have to hand in two, three, four, five rights to get a new share. And that makes sense, because if you were to get 100,000 shares, you would now have 200,000 shares when there's only 1.2, and so your percentage would go up. So the way I know, in case they don't tell you, I hope they don't. I hope they do. I hope they don't ask you this, or I hope they do tell you what what the right is. So to to figure out, I'm stuttering like an idiot. To figure out how many rights I have to hand in, I just do this. I take the million, I put the two hundred thousand under that, and I divide whatever number that is. This is going to be five in this case. Five rights to one new share. Because that's that's how many rights I'd have to hand in. So in this case, since I have 100,000 rights divided by five, I'm going to get 20,000 new shares. Now, remember, I don't get them. I have to buy them. So if I'm going to do an issuance at, say I'm the company, I'm doing making me a lot, okay? Say I'm the company and I issue you know these shares, but I'm going to issue them at 20 bucks a share. I'll give you the ability to buy them at like 18. So you'll have to pay the money. You'll have to pay the, if you want to get new shares, you'll have to buy 20,000 shares and pay 18, but it is a bargain. And that's the point here. You're getting it at a discount. Do you have, they're not long-term. You don't have a lot of time to think about it, but if you do get a right, you have a couple of things you can do. One, you can exercise it, which means buy it. Two, you can sell the shares in the open market for whatever they're worth. You will not have to do that math. Three, you can give it as a gift, anyone you want. Four, you can um, let them expire. It's moronic, but you can because you're giving money away. You don't have to do anything, but you cannot redeem them back to the company. That's the big thing. The company won't want them back. Okay. Now, here's the thing with this. So I have videos on stock splits and stuff like that. You can watch them. I'm not going to do that here. This is just a general overview so you get a feel. Now, when you buy common stock, what happens? You're getting, you're getting ownership of the company. And as the company does better, the stock price goes up because people want to buy it. As the stock goes, if the company does bad, the stock will drop. It's all supply and demand. But the thing you, the reasons, and this is what I promised you before, the reasons you buy common stock are really this three reasons. One, you buy it for capital appreciation growth. Now, you don't have to pay, and we'll get back to that. So you don't pay taxes on it until you actually sell it. A second one is income, not as heavy, but that's dividends. And the third one is inflation protection. That's one of the biggest ones, right? Because if you buy common stock and you hold it, it averages around a 10% return every year in general, which beats the shit out of inflation, except for 2022. Then, I mean, who knows? Inflation's fucking nuts. But um, the stock stocks, common stock should almost always outpace inflation over the long haul. Unlike fixed income, where you buy, you get the same amount of money every time, inflation goes up, your money's worth less and less every year where common stock goes up and up and it beats inflation. So you buy it for capital appreciation, you buy it for income, and you buy it for inflation protection. Now, remember, it's very cost efficient. It's tax efficient. Because if you buy stock at 20 and you just buy and hold and don't think about it for 15 years, it's going to grow. You don't pay taxes as it's growing. You'll pay taxes at the end. And the good thing is it's going to be taxed at a long-term capital gain rate, which is 15 or 20%. Also, the dividends they pay you. The first one, yeah, you're paying full boat for it, right? But if you own the stock for 60 days before 
and 60 days after the X date and keep doing it, all your new dividends are taxed at a, at a lower rate, which is equivalent to the capital gains rate. And that's called the qualified dividend. Only common and preferred get qualified dividends. But let's say I want a more consistent dividend. Okay. I could buy utility stocks or bank stocks or like maybe a REIT or something like that, which we're not talking about today. But but maybe I really want a more consistent dividend. So I'm going to switch to preferred stock. Now, remember, preferred stock is not common stock. It's its own thing. Preferred stock is its own thing. It's not common. It's, it is equity, but it doesn't have nearly the rights. The only reason you buy preferred stock is for the income, the dividend. Because if the company has a great year, it's not fucking moving. If the company has a bad year, other than bankruptcy, it's not moving. The price won't move. The only thing that will move or preferred is interest rates, for the most part, or credit ratings, maybe. Um, so you buy a preferred for income, because like, say you buy an 8% preferred, that's going to pay you 8% of par. Par on preferreds is normally 100. So you're going to buy an 8% preferred, it's going to pay you 80 bucks. 80? No, 8 bucks a year. 8% of 100, so it's going to pay you 8 bucks a year, and it's either going to be $2 a quarter or $4, $4 every six months. I sound like a fool, so I figured I'd just go right into a stupid accent. So that's a preferred. And here's the thing. They don't actually owe it to you, right? Preferreds are always at the whim of the board of directors. Now, by the way, I'm assuming you know how to do dividends. I didn't. I had to do the whole dividend. You know that. It's um, it's by the board of directors. I assume you know how to do X date. If not, I'll put a video here in the in the common suck one to help you out. I have a shitload of videos on that. Now, preferred stock pays a fixed dividend. So if you buy an 8% preferred, it's going to pay you eight bucks a year. Again, they don't have to pay it. Board of directors will be very wary, is that a word, of not paying it because if they miss a dividend payment, who the fuck's going to, I mean, the only reason you buy the preferred is to get the fucking dividend, right? So if they stop paying, boom, they'll dump it and they'll never be able to issue another one. It's kind of a thing. So they're really not going to skip it. And what happens is a regular preferred, if I, um, if I issue a regular preferred and I don't pay for 2021 or 2020 because of the pandemic, Come 2022, I only owe you 2022's dividend that year, okay? I don't owe you the old one. So they made a new, they made another type of preferred, and you got to know this, called the cumulative, okay? So let's talk about it. Okay, so here we have our 8% preferred, cumulative preferred. You have to see that or you don't worry about this stuff. So we're supposed to be 8 bucks a year because remember, par on IBM, par on a preferred is 100 bucks. Okay, now... We're supposed to eight bucks a year. That means, you know, $2 every quarter. Let's say during 2020, we pay nothing. 2021, we pay three. So what do we have to pay in 2022 to catch up? So we have to make up the last one. So we have to do eight plus five, whatever that is. That's 13, I guess. And then add another eight. So that's going to be 21. So I will have to pay, to be able to pay the common after this, I will have to pay... $21. I have to make up all the previous ones that we missed and this year's. Boom. Okay. Now let's change it up a little bit. Let's pretend this is participating. Okay. But we'll talk about it for a second. Participating. Participating preferred. Okay. Now, if I have a really, so we're going to get paid eight bucks a year, no matter what. Now, what happens if we have a fucking bang out year? IBM comes out with the newest product. It's, it's planted in your eye and you can have the old the computing power, blah, blah, blah. The profits are going to go up. The eye, Everything's going to go up. The stock, the common stock is going to go up. But what happened to this? It doesn't freaking change. It's still 8%. Doesn't change unless we make it participating. Now, they're not going to make you go through the nitty gritty of how it works, but understand what happens in the, in the prospectus. It'll say we have our 8% participating preferred. And it'll say under certain circumstances, we will bump that up. So what happens is they'll pay the 8%, they'll go pay the common, and then they'll come back and pay you more, like maybe another three, four dollars, two dollars, whatever it is. But if the company has a good year, they will bump you up. And it's all written in the prospectus. So that's the difference between cumulative 
and participating preferred. Now we also have convertible preferred, but you treat it exactly the same as we did the convertible bonds. I'll do, let's do it real quick. We'll just do one. I'm not gonna go crazy on it. Okay, so let's say we have the IBM 8% convertible preferred. It's trading at 104, it converts at 25 bucks and IBM is trading at 27. So the question is, if they call the bond or we have to do something, would it be profitable to convert it? So remember, this is gonna turn into common stock if you choose to. So here we go. So first thing is always gonna be par divided by the convertible price. Par divided by what is this 25 is a convertible price. That's gonna give me four. That means for every preferred I hand in, I'm gonna get four shares of common. So the price of the preferred should almost always be trading four times the common. Let's see if it is. So the next step is gonna be, you multiply the ratio of four times 27. Because that's, remember, you're getting four shares of IBM. So four shares of IBM is gonna be worth $108. So that's kind of the parity. So the common stock's value is 108. The preferred is only 104, so it's a value. I would, I would do that all day long. I would buy the preferred at 104, and at the same time, sell short four shares of IBM at 27 to receive 108. And then I just use the shares, the, I would convert the preferred and then use that to pay off my short. And that would be an ar convertible arbitrage situation. So this is a, a situation where you would convert it. Now, remember the reason to buy convertibles. And again, the re a convertible preferred sounds great, but the thing is you're going to give up a lot of yield because they're adding something really good for you. The fact that you can convert it. So the yield they're going to pay you is going to be a lot less than a regular non-convertible preferred because you're getting both the yield and the capital appreciation. Now, remember preferred is considered fixed income. So boom. Okay. It's a fixed income. Boom. So it's going to be paying 8% every year, but then they have adjustable rates where it, the move up and down based on the current rates so if you have a 4% preferred, rates go to five, it'll go to five, rates go to eight, it'll go to eight. But also if you have a 5% preferred and rates go to three, it's gonna to go to three. So you don't have really interest rate risk, but you are getting a return that's gonna change all the time. And it's kind of a nice thing. But again, that's better for the investors. So the yield is gonna be lower than if you bought a regular straight preferred. Now always think of straight preferreds as like fixed income. So they are callable or not callable. Anything fixed income is pretty going to be pretty much going to be issued with the possibility of being called. What is called? That means the company is going to buy the shares back. Okay. okay. Um, I don't know if you'll see this, but there's a thing called K shares. So what they do is that you buy them at like four or 5%. It lasts five, 10 years, whatever the hell that is. And then it starts being an adjustable. So K shares, it's a fixed rate. And then it's adjustable. It adjusts up and down based on the current rates. Okay. Penny stocks. That's if you see Wolf of Wall Street, that's what we're talking about. These are like the risky, risky securities. These are the ones that have a lot of their own rules. Penny stocks, for definition wise, they are stocks, unlisted equity securities under $5 a share. So remember, this is under $5 and not on an exchange. So if you have a $4 stock trading on the exchange, that's not a penny stock. If you have an $8 stock trading over the counter, that's not a penny stock. It has to be or not on an exchange and less than $5. When you solicit for penny stocks, there are, there are three things that you absolutely must disclose to the customer all the time. The current quote, the compensation that the broker dealer will receive, and the compensation that you, the register rep, will receive. That is a no-brainer. That is all the time. Even if they're an established customer or whatever, you have to disclose those three things. The current quote, how much I'm making, and how much a broker-dealer is making every single time. Now, um, if you have penny stocks in your account, you must get monthly statements. That's the only time you have to get monthly statements. Yeah, there's, everyone thinks that, oh, if you have activity in your account, you have to get monthly statements versus quarterly. That's just for best practices. It's not a FINRA rule. FINRA has nothing under the quarterly other than penny stocks. So if you do any sort of, if a customer has a penny stock, 
in his account, then he must get monthly statements because they don't want that sitting for three months because they're too fucking risky. As far as certain things that have to happen for certain customers, we have to make sure that when we open the account, we have to do a couple of things. One, we have to determine that they're suitable. Two, they have to get a written suitability statement, okay? Manually signed, okay? I am telling you, you have to have it signed. So you have to make sure that they're suitable and they, they fit all the things that you have, oh, things, whatever. They meet the suitability requirements. Two, they have to be, have a suitability statement assigned by the customer. This is, we think it's suitable. You're signing it, boom, okay. Once you have a, an established customer, which means they have money, a customer has money invested in your, in the account for over a year or has done three separate penny stock transactions on three separate days, then you don't have to do this account approval shit anymore. You have to do that when they're not meet the established customer, but you don't have to do it once they get it, okay? Secondly, those disclosures I talked about before, they still apply even for an established customer. So what's a warrant? A warrant is like, is a derivative. It's, it's like a right in a way, except for the right is issued where you can buy it in the money. They're short-term. Warrants are long-term. They're issued out of the money, which means they have no intrinsic value. So here's what a warrant is. I go to issue a bond at 5% or say 8%. I don't want to pay fucking 8%. That's too fucking high. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to try to make it more attractive so I can either secure it or I can you know, make it non-callable or some other thing, but I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is anyone who buys my bond, I'm going to give them a warrant, the ability to buy one, two, five shares, whatever, of my company. But it's not right now, okay? I'm going to let them buy shares of my company, but I'm not going to let them do it now. So if the stock is trading at 33, I'm going to give them the right to buy it at like 40 or 45 or 50. Now, it sounds shitty, but what the whole goal is that they're long-term, seven, five, seven, 10, 20 years, perpetual even, so that eventually the stock should cross that, that price. So if I say this, if the stock's trading at 33 and I give you the right to buy it at 40, you're like, whatever, but it's going to make the bond more attractive so I can lower the coupon because you have the right to do something. So now, as long as the stock stays below 40, nothing's there. Once the stock goes over 40, that warrant starts gaining in value quickly. Because a warrant, there, the price of the warrant is directly tied or associated with the price of the stock. If it's below intrinsic, it won't move that much. But once the stock, if there's no intrinsic, which means the stock is trading below the strike price, the warrant will move a little bit, but not a lot. But once the stock crosses the strike price of the warrant, it's going to move lockstep with it. Basically, every dollar the stock goes up, the warrant will go up in price also. There you go. Warrants are long-term. They're issued as a sweetener on a deal. So if I'm going to do a um, bond, I don't want to issue at such a high rate. I'll say anyone who buys my bond, you'll get a right to buy stock at a later date at a higher price, but hopefully that higher price will be lower than where it's trading when you want to do it. Again, rights are short-term, issued in the money. Warrants are long-term, issued out of the money. What the hell is an ADR? An ADR is a foreign security trading here, but it's actually not. It represents a foreign security trading here. So say I have UBS, they have an office in London, and they really like, they're going to start packaging up British petroleum. They feel there's a demand in the US to buy British petroleum. So instead of BP actually registering in the US, dealing with Sarbanes Oxley and all our rules, UBS, who's already here and already following our rules, will buy a bunch of shares of British petroleum and package them. Boom. They'll buy a bunch of shares, put it in here, and then this thing will be trading in the U.S. as an ADR. So this, this thing will represent one, two, five, 20 shares of a foreign security. So, it, so ADRs enable foreign securities to trade here. The actual security isn't, but it's a representative of it, an American depository receipt, an ADR. So there's two types. They're sponsored, which means we're working with British Petroleum. And, we, and there's certain things you get with that. Second, unsponsored means we're not buying it with uh, cooperation of the company. And we really can't usually trade it on the exchange. So I don't know that they're going to ask that deep. 
But if it's sponsored, it could trade on an exchange because you're working with the company who's issuing the shares. Unsponsored means we're not working with British Petroleum and it usually can't trade on an exchange. I don't think it goes deeper than that. Now, remember when you um, buy common stock and you get a dividend, that dividend is going to be taxed at ordinary income as you get it. You don't get to defer it. Even if you reinvest it, yes, if you reinvest the dividend, it's going to increase your cost basis because you bought more shares, not because you got the dividend. The dividend is going to be come to you and you're going to get taxed at ordinary income. If it's qualified, I talked about that, means you held the stock for more than 60 days before and after the X day. It's a much lower rate, okay? Always remember, dividends will always be taxed. Stock dividends won't be. Cash dividends will. I'm not going to do the whole stock dividend split thing because I have it. I'll put a video here that you can watch, okay? Now, what's very interesting, the IRS and the government really likes cross-ownership of companies. So they offer this great deal for corporations. So if a corporation owns another corporation and gets a dividend, they only pay tax on 50% of it. It's called the corporate dividend exclusion. It's pretty fucking awesome. So if I, my company, my corporation owns shares of Ford and they pay a dividend, I will only pay tax on half of that. Now, if I happen to own more than 20% of the company, I only pay tax on 35%. But this corporate dividend exclusion, you need to remember this, only applies to common and preferred, not REITs, not mutual funds, not interest, okay? And the reason it doesn't do mutual fund and, and REITs is because mutual fund and REITs pass through 90% of their income, so the dividends come pretty much untaxed. So the IRS wants to tax it full. Common stock and preferred dividends, the company gets the money, they pay tax on it, they pay you, and then you pay tax. So it's kind of double taxed. With REITs and mutual funds, it's only single tax, so that's why they don't offer the break. They offer the break to you for common and preferred dividends because it's double taxed and they can do that. Now, I'm rambling. Let's Dividend on a foreign security, you're going to get paid. The other country or company is going to withhold some of it. What's great is that that, not great, who the hell wants to pay fucking taxes, but any taxes you pay, to a foreign company or foreign government, you're really paying to the government, but the company holds it back, will be considered a credit or a deduction on your taxes in the US. That helps. As far as taxes go, if you buy stock of a, if you buy common stock, your, what you paid is your cost basis. So if you buy, you know, 100 shares at 50, And let's say you actually buy 100 shares at 51, and then you buy 100 shares at 52. It rises to 60, and you're not greedy. You're just going to sell a little bit. So you sell 100 shares. Sell 100 shares. Now, the question is, which fucking shares are you selling? You're not allowed to average price it. If it's a mutual fund, you can. Regular stock, you have to pick, okay? I guess if you sell all of it, then you can average it, but this is not what we're talking about. I only sold 100 shares. So if I do not mention a method, if I don't say, hey, I want to do this, the IRS automatically does FIFO, which means they take the first thing you bought because in their eyes, that'll be the most, the cheapest. So I will pay taxes on $10, okay? on 100 shares, if I do FIFO, meaning I don't mention a method. But I can do select a share where I actually choose share selection. I can choose which shares I'm going to sell. So if I buy the stock at those three prices and I sell 100 shares at 60, I don't want to choose this one. I'm going to choose this one. So then I only pay taxes on $8. Eventually, I'll get screwed on this. But right now, I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to, so I'm going to pick the shares I bought at 52. I say I sold them. I only pay taxes on eight bucks. Hopefully it's long term. So I pay a lower tax bracket. If I don't choose a method, it is absolutely going to be FIFO. If I choose a method, I can choose, I can choose the shares I do. But once I pick a method, I can't change my mind. Okay. Here's a new one for us. Let's say everyone always has a question. Is. So let's say grandma, grandma, I'm going to do it that way, Tilly. buys shares of GE at 52, we wish. Okay, 
Now, two scenarios. Grandma gives it to you, gives it when the stock is trading at 60 bucks. We'll say up here, stock is trading at 60 bucks. And she gives it to her little bambino as a gift. Okay? Bambina also. She gives her bambina at when it's trading at 60. Bambina then sells it, the little and great, sells it at 62. Since this is a gift, there is no step up of gloss basis. So Bambina gets it at 52 technically and sells it at 62. She will owe taxes on $10. And that's going to be long or short, depending on when grandma bought it. She's going to get grandma, if it's a gift, she gets grandma's holding period and her price. Boom. Okay. Next scenario. Grandma gets hit by a fucking bus. I'm obsessed with buses. I work in the city all the time. Okay. There, I, I, I can't believe how many times I've almost got hit. I used to read books as I walk all the time. And one time I turned and basically they're so quiet because they're gas or electric, whatever it is. I turned and the mirror hit me in the head and knocked my hat off. I was like, if I was two seconds earlier, I would have been dead because I didn't fucking hear it. Okay. Because they drive right along the curb. Now, I digress. So Grandma Tilly, same thing. She bought the shares at 52, but this time she got hit by a bus, so she's dead. Okay? And she, and, and Bambina, can I do it that way? No. Bambina inheritance, okay? Bambina, Bambina, she's crying, so she's not happy. Bambina inherits. Now, and then she, let's say the ingrate, she, again, she sells it at 62. Here's the difference. So let's say, again, Grandma Tilly dies when the stock is at $60. And then Bambina inherits it, sells it at 62. And when somebody dies, it is the cost basis to step up. This doesn't matter anymore. It is now this. So Bambina gets it at 60. And it's always long term. Even if grandma bought it the week before and then she get hit by the bus, it's considered long term to Bambina. And here's the thing. The new cost basis is 60. She gets to sell it at 62. She only pays two dollars. Remember, cost basis is what you pay. Proceeds is this 62 is what you got. The difference is your capital gain or loss. Remember that cost basis is what you pay. Proceeds is what you sell it for. The difference that $2 is your capital gain or loss. Now, remember, if the stock goes up and you don't sell it or anything or whatever, you don't pay taxes on it because it's an unrealized gain. There's no taxes on unrealized gain other than some people in Congress and Senate trying to change it, which is just fucked up. Okay, anyway, guys, thanks a lot. That's equity. That's common and preferred. Thank you for listening. Um, please like, subscribe, share. Let's have some fun.